Steve, thanks very much for joining me today. I wanted during this uh, lockdown period to do something I've wanted to do for a while, really, speak to people that have inspired me and a lot of other people throughout my life. Uh, and I know you're too kind to say it, but you're quite an inspirational guy. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about things, looking back on my career and doing something like this, you do um, tend to t just analyse a little bit more than you would ordinarily about, you know, what, what's happened and the people you've sort of met and touched. And, and, and to be honest, I've always wanted, uh, certainly in my coaching career and management career, to... Um, you know, be a role model. I think it was something that was always significant for me with my own father. I always felt upon him as being a, a role model, not just for me, but for other people, uh, my siblings as, uh, and other people around. Um, so having been in a position of authority within football, I've, I've always thought that I wanted to try and do things right. Not a question of karma, but just to do the right things as often as possible. You're one of those very rare people in football and in life that when I've worked with and then later on sort of past people that have worked with you, not a lot of people criticise you, Steve, which is means you got it right there. Well, the criticism I would perhaps make of myself then was I sat on the fence too often. Uh, uh, yeah, I, again, I... The, the more I became a, a manager or the better I became a manager, I feel I, I was more inclusive. When I first started as a manager, I was very much, it was me, 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 make decisions, do things. Um, I, I would listen to other people, but I didn't like to sort of include them in the decision making process. I thought, well, it's my job. You know, they have their specific jobs. My job is, is management. My job is leading. So, but, um, you know, the events happened, I think, probably most at Reading, um, which met, brought about a change in my management to a certain extent. And from then onwards, I was very much more inclusive of, of making people part of the decision-making process and not just me. So, you know, from that point of view, it, it was, uh, um, you know, a lot more um, management team decision-making process rather than just the manager. You say events happened at Reading. What, what events happened well, that made you change? Uh, at Reading, I had a really good situation. I, I, I had a chairman, and, and again, in football, the most critical relationship is manager and chairman or manager in, or owner. And I always say in football, um, the 70 clubs you don't really want to manage. Now, those 70 clubs change on a year-by-year -year basis. The art of management is choosing the 20 or so where you've got underperforming clubs in the wrong division or you just happened because of the circumstances of contracts now you happen to get a really good squad of players and a good situation but the relationship between the the, the chairman and the the, the manager it is critical that it has to be um, friendly to a certain extent joint decision making have the same goals um, and be part of the same process of trying to be successful now at Reading I had Sir John Majewski who for me was perfect. The day I signed for Reading, he said to me, um, listen, Steve, I know nothing about football. So you take care of the football, I'll take care of the business. Now, I always say, for someone who knew nothing about football, he always knew the right questions to ask. So he obviously undermined his own uh, strategy, I suppose, about uh, football. He, he knew what football was about, but he always played uh, dumb on occasion. Uh, so we had a great relationship and I went there, I took over a good squad of players. I think my first year taking over Alan Pardew's team, I finished ninth. My second year, I finished seventh. And my third year, I'm thinking, realistically, if I don't get promotion this year, 
I'm probably going to be out of work. And I was very much of the opinion during that summer of contemplation before the season started, keep on doing the things you're doing and you'll get more of the things you've got. I thought, if I don't change something, we might just sneak into the playoffs. So we made the decision to make a significant uh, million pound signing, which was Leroy Lita, which obviously was a difference. But also um, we made the decision or I made the decision um, to bring in a management company, a company who were totally divorced from football. Uh, a gentleman called Mark Reynolds and his company was called Catalyst. And they came in and they just reviewed everything we did. We also did personality profiles of the staff and the players to understand not the obvious dynamics and relationships, but you know what lies a little bit deeper. And I must admit, it was fascinating to review those uh, conclusions in terms of learning styles, learning methods, in terms of the dynamics of uh, the relationships amongst um, the staff. And it turns out that one of the most significant things that we, we discovered or Mark discovered in his company and the, the analysis discovered that possibly the most important person in the backroom staff was the kit man. Now, the kit man we had was a, a lovely bloke called Ron Grant, who had been at the club for many, many years. He was a, a lovely, and still is, a lovely, genial gentleman of a, a human being. And obviously, as a kit man, you're in the dressing room. Players come in, throwing boots, throwing kit, moaning, complaining. He was there, heard it all. He would get every grouse under the sun. He would listen to the staff complaints because people just gravitated towards the kit room for whatever reason. And I still look back and think I was just so fortunate to have this bloke who's... So intent. You get a lot of people sometimes in clubs in the it's sort of the back roles who are moaners, professional moaners, complainers. Nothing's ever right. We don't do this. We don't invest. We don't. And I was lucky that I had Ron and the staff. It wasn't just Ron, but the whole staff. We had this common goal to get promotion. And, you know, we, we did a lot of work that summer. Um, I very often went to Scandinavia for pre-season tours and we did an awful lot of work there, um, preparing not only the team, but also the staff and how we were going to change our way of working. And again, I, I say from that summer, um, I, I, I got a restored faith in meetings because I, I was never really a meeting person. You know, to quote Ron Nodes, one of my other chairmans, the best committee is a committee of one. <laughs> and I, I, I'd always sort of had that philosophy in my own mind. And yet that summer, um, dealing with everything and, and the involvement that um, Mark and his team had with my team, from then onwards, we started having an awful lot more meetings. The players, players meetings, uh, I would have meetings every day, sometimes twice a day with the staff about things and, and really included them in everything. And I thought, before we'd kicked the ball that season, I thought, well, we've signed a really top striker to complement our staff. Um, we've changed the dynamic of the decision-making process within the, the management staff. And from... From there, I thought, right, we've cracked it. This is before we kicked the ball. Our first game of the season was Plymouth at home, which to all intents and purposes, a team with real aspirations to get promotion, it should have been tick the box, yes, three points. And lo and behold, we get beat 2-1. So after that game, I was... I was so down. It was unbelievable. I, I went that whole weekend and I'm thinking, is what we've done just a waste of time? All this lovey-dovey, 
let's be let's be united, let's team spirit, let's get everything all sorted. We're all on the same page. I'm thinking, has this been a waste of time? And our next game, I always remember, it was Brighton away. A tricky fixture for me because I'd been manager of Brighton. Um, it was at the with Dean. I'm thinking, oh, you know, this is a banana skin. Another banana skin after Plymouth waiting to happen. And yet we won that game 2-0 fairly comfortably. And from then onwards, we, we were only beaten, beaten once more in the whole season. And we still hold the record, 106 points for the season, 99 goals, something I'm, I'm just amazingly proud of. Um, and I think it was down to that real period of analysis, uh, management transition, myself included, but everybody on the staff, we all self-analyzed. And, you know, we, 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 we changed more or less everything we did, but it was so much more inclusive that uh, it was totally against what I'd done previously. That's one of the reasons I like you, Steve, so much. You've been managing for years, what, maybe 10 years before that changed. So you was, you was able to look at yourself and the way you managed and say, I could change. I could learn well, something else. Always trying to do that, Bob, but in a certain way, resisting it. You know, I, I thought, well... You know, I read so many things, you, you know, in particular, that I used to read an awful lot about American sports, American cultures. I always felt they were sort of in advance of what we were doing. You know, everybody who was a coach has read Lombardi and stuff like this. And But I'd, I'd gone in, I, I became fascinated with Bill Belichick and the, the New England uh, dynasty he created and like his manner. His manner is, you know, leave me alone and I'm doing my job. You know, he, he's something I, I used to get into training early to listen to his previous day's press conferences in New England. And I used to think, well, he is one of the most successful coaches in American football and consistently successful. Not initially, but once he'd started the ball rolling at New England, it was Super Bowl, Super Bowl, division champions. This, and I'm thinking what he's doing it's got to be right. But then, you know, looking back on it now, I had this thirst and desire and quest to improve myself personally as a, as a manager and a coach. But you can only ever be yourself. I always remember the first, the first day I got the job at Crystal Palace, 28-year-old rookie, didn't have a clue what I was doing. My first year at Crystal Palace, I always say, was the blind leading the blind because I didn't know what I was doing. And my team wasn't very good, I hate to say. And um, I got a phone call that day from Tommy Doherty, who was my manager, a gentleman who I had so much respect for. And he, he said to me, uh, he said, what kind of manager do you think you'll be? And I said, well, I don't know. Time will tell. He says, I'll tell you. He said, be yourself because you can't be anybody else. You can be somebody else, you can act for a certain amount of time, but you'll give yourself away. So don't try and be anybody else. Don't try and copy anybody else. Just be yourself. And I've often thought back on that and thought, yeah, that's probably the best bit of advice. Because inevitably when you're a manager, you see the way other managers do things. And if they're successful, you think, well, I've got to try and be an Alex Ferguson or, you know, Jurgen Klopp or a Jose Mourinho. And inevitably, you might sort of do it, keep up the pretense for a day or so, but your true person personality comes out when you're under pressure. And the last thing you want to be is a sort of schizophrenic manager. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that even now, people say to me, you know, what advice would you give? I say, be yourself, I would say to any manager, any coach, don't try and be anybody else. Be the best you you can be. And that's what I always strove to be, which is why I would read so much about American sports in particular, but also, um, you know, try and go on courses in this country. We used to have some terrific management courses in days gone by at Lillishaw. 
and you'd be rubbing shoulders with people and you'd be, you know, you'd be watching them all the time like a hawk just to see how they conduct themselves. You know, um, I was fortunate as a player to, you know, be involved with some really uh, terrific managers and you sort of try and pick the best out of the best and just add little bits to your repertoire as a, a manager and a coach and but it was always, you know, and still is now. I, I, I still look at people in successful positions and think, well, why are they successful? What do they bring to the table that nobody else can? And why does it fail when such and such leaves a certain club? Or, or why a successful manager goes to another club? Isn't he successful? You know, it's still a real sort of hunger and a thirst for me. To, to try and extract what makes success in the football field. And, Steve, what do you think it is? Because, like you say, you, you're invited to join a club when it's struggling, so things are not that great. So what is it that can help create that culture of success, whatever that is defined for at that club? How do you create that? Well, initially, you're judged on the performance of the team. So, inevitably, despite all the analysis of, of management techniques, management styles, management personalities, I think every manager will say recruitment is still the number one job of uh, a manager, coach, first team coach. Player recruitment is still... You know, I always used to say about Alex Ferguson, if he was manager of Rochdale, would they have won the European Cup? Obviously, no. Would they have improved? Obviously, yes. And, you know, looking at it now, the more I see the movement of, of managers, coaches, the more I see that recruitment, player recruitment is critical. And then it's the role of the manager to keep that playing machine at its very best, which is a different uh, skill, different skill set. But both of those combined are, are probably that what makes uh, a successful coach manager, without doubt. You can go into all the uh, nuances of, of so many different things. But if you're a coach and you, know, you haven't got uh, a great squad of players, and that's why, like even today, it, it fairly simplistically, people say to me, what makes a great club? I said, well, you know, success in football is easy. If you've got the most money, you sign the best players and then you've got the best team. And to a certain extent, that is true because if you look at the finances of all the premiership clubs, year on year on year, it almost reflects the spend of the club. Now, having said that, you can still be successful if you're not high up in the spend league, you know, Leicester winning the league, magnificent, but it happens once every 25 years. Um, you know, loads of clubs punch above the weight and that's because of the, the, the lead of the manager and the coach, the recruitment of the club, the uh, connection between the owners and the coaching staff. You know, all these things are critical, but at the end of the day, the English Premiership is a handicap competition because you are more or less destined to finish where your spend dictates, <laughs> which is sad in a way. But within that, you get so many magnificent highs and lows of individual performances or um, periods of performances. And that elusive success is what we all crave. You say about the uh, the highs and the lows, but I've heard you speak about the duration of the highs, not very long compared to the uh, to the lows. Yeah, twenty minutes. I always used to say that after a game, and you know, given the planning that's involved in a game now, you know, I, I looking back, I I think I was probably certainly amongst the first couple of managers who used to do video analysis and I look now at all the clubs and they have six or seven analysts who are going through every game 
across the world looking for talent and looking for holes in uh, opposition uh, defences and what have you. And looking back at my own uh, journey, I, I think I was one of the first. I remember I used to have a stack of VH, VHS video recorders and I used to tape them or over tape, over tape and, and do that. And, um, you know, that work that was involved in that was a three-day process to produce a 10-minute video, which I would show the players. And that, in um, cooperation, in, that's the wrong word, in conjunction, rather, with the preparation on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for the opposition, all that work and graft involved in trying to get your ideas across to the players. And then you win a game, and it would be brilliant. The, the feeling you would get... 20 minutes, magnificent. The joy you would feel in the dressing room, and you know you know that feeling as well. It, it's just winning the pools, 20 minutes. And then you think, oh no, we got Man City away next week. And straight away you'd start thinking, you know, have I got the videos for that? How, what are we going to do training this week? And you'd be off. The process. And again, that is the more I managed, the more I thought in terms of the process. And the process of preparation had to be unaffected by the previous result. So you could be lower than a snake's belly after a, a game on a Saturday, and you could pine away Saturday night, Sunday. You could... Re so many regrets, I should have done this, should have done that. And inevitably, it would affect your performance on a Monday in front of the players. And the, the sort of better I, or the longer I became a manager, the more I realised that you couldn't affect what's gone by. Hard though it was, you had to review the game. I always watched the game in the cold light of day a review of the match um, and watch the game, make my conclusions and then boom, full stop, the process of the next game. It had to be separate. The previous game would have to have no effect on it. And that was the same if we won. If we won, if we were playing, I don't know, a real difficult game, Liverpool away and we won, you would be euphoric. And the, the obvious uh, reaction would be to lighten up next week because well, we've just beaten Liverpool. We don't need to do all that preparation. We're a really great team. But the more I realised, the longer I did it, the more I realised the process had to be untouchable. And it was very much, today's Monday, this is what we do. Today's Tuesday, this is what we do. And that, I clung more and more to that, to such an extent, I think sometimes people thought I was a little bit divorced from results and I was glad of that because it's all about the process the process of preparation is the most important thing in football and it has to be one game at a time in isolation at, at Reading we coined, coined the phrase which was all around the training ground WNG win next game that's all it was forget the last game that's gone to bed win next game. Can we win next game? Yes, we can. How do we go about winning next game? They were the questions that had to be asked and answered in the preparation. The process was the thing that it was all about. Fantastic thought process, Steve. You, the, I remember working with you many years ago and uh, little gems just stick in my mind. Apart from anything, one of the things you said to me, which I always remember, you said in the car you used to listen to tapes a lot and you didn't yeah. listen to music that much. Can you tell me about that? Well, again, uh, you know, personal development is a real, it certainly used to be something which is sort of, we didn't really talk about a great deal. You know, you, you kept that to yourself. And, you know, I, I used to get, again, I used to go to, um, um, personal development uh, weekends and conferences, you know, a bit like the Tony Robbins stuff now, which is 
boom, there in your face. It's full on. You know, I used to go to a lot more discreet things, um, but the same message, you know, the same message in a variety of different ways. You know, like even now, I, um, not my favorite book, but probably the book I reference more than any other all, all throughout my management career um, would be Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, which is, I think, the worst title ever. At the time, he thought it was brilliant. And, you know, I studied Napoleon Hill because he, he was I, probably the godfather of personal development. And his book, Think and Grow Rich, Rich The 13 Principles, I probably referenced more than any other book and my bookshelves, it's, uh, it is a classic. It is, you know, to a lot of people would look at it and think, well, that's a load of baloney, but it resonated with me. And very often, you know, some, when you're in management, you're under, you're under the cosh. And sometimes I would just pick little bits from there. I didn't agree with everything he said or wrote about, but I certainly, um, checked it out on a regular basis and from that I, I developed a, um, a sort of library of tapes and again in those days you could just go on Y Scout and watch a match uh, at random at will whenever you wanted you know I always remember classic thing when I was at Crystal Palace my first couple of years um I always appreciated myself as a player knowing who I was playing against and what kind of a player he was. And when I was a manager, that was one of the things I wanted to do, give a, um, uh, an opinion about the opposition, give a, a breakdown analysis of the way they played, strengths, weaknesses, how we can hurt them, how we can beat them. And without, in the early days, the benefits of videos or anything like that, you used to have to do the miles. You know, you would be going up and down motorways watching games. And I was lucky with Ron Nodes at Crystal Palace. He loved watching football. So the two of us, we would watch 10, 15, 20 games a week. We would do three games in a day sometimes if we could. But if we could, we'd do them every day. And I always remember once, my first season, we played, we were due to play Carlisle. And we were playing Carlisle at home. And I, in my first year, I didn't know anything about the teams in what was then Division Two. So I thought, can I go into Carlisle? They had a midweek game against Fulham at home. So Carlisle from South London is just an unbelievable journey. They were playing Wednesday night. So we trained Wednesday and I, I made the decision, I've got to go. So I drove all the way to Carlisle, no M25. This was North Circular, South Circular, M1, M6. Hell of a journey. I got there, I watched the game. Fulham beat Carlisle, I think it was 1-0. But I looked at the Carlisle team and I think they had five players over 30. And I'm thinking, they're playing Wednesday night. They've got to come down to South London for the Saturday game. They got beat by Fulham. And basically, my, my conclusion was the pitch was too, too big for them. They didn't have the legs to get around. Too many old players. So I get back about three in the morning, training the next day, Thursday, the preparation day for me. So I got there, I got this knowledge in my head. I said to the players, listen, they're, they're a capable side, but the pitch is too big for them. They haven't got the legs to run around. We play at a high tempo. You know, we, we, we'll beat them. We'll beat them. We've got to move the ball quick, get at them as quickly as possible. So Saturday comes along. I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I feel I've, I've done the work. The team are ready. Carlisle at home. We should be okay. An hour before the game kicks off, I look at their team sheet. They dropped all their players over 30. <laughs> they had these young kids 
running around like lunatics. I think we drew the game in the end, but I'm thinking, <laughs> there's no logic. It's just not fair. It's not fair. I've gone all that way. I've done all that work. And it never worked. And, but basically, that is management. You go down a hundred blind alleys and occasionally there's a pot of gold. But sometimes it's a, it's a trying occupation. Steve, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things you used to say. I mean, your preparation was excellent at, uh, when I worked with you. Short Thank time you. at Palace, Brentford, Brighton. And I still remember coming out of some of those team meetings on a Friday when you had those videos and, you, were, you know, we didn't have all the tech now to, to, to cut and paste little things. Yeah. You used to sit down, I remember, and, and yeah. go through those videos. But the meetings were so thorough and we come out of those meetings feeling so prepared. I remember one game you said from the kickoff that they're going to put it to their full backs and they're going to ping it onto the edge of our box, but onto the like the corner of the box. And they grow the grass a bit so it, the ball's not going yeah. <laughs> to roll out. And from the kickoff, the ball went out and the centre-backs were just like, we're having this all day long because they were so well prepared. Yeah. It was just like, and I remember looking at you at the time and you were focused on the game thinking, that was brilliant because the lads went out and they were like, we know exactly what's going to happen. You said, Yeah, was I was, well, you know, for, for one, as I said before, for one 10 minute video, and I always felt for the players, you know, the average attention span as of you and though would probably be 10 minutes maximum. But people now are used to looking at videos, televisions, and, you know, my, my thought process was if it's longer than 10 minutes, it's too long because their minds will stray. So, you know, I felt upon that sort of Friday morning meeting, the video meeting, as it were, as being the most important part of the week for me. I mean, an eight, seven, eight, nine minute video would be the result of possibly watching the opposition five, six times. I would certainly do at least three vid video analysis and, and go from there. And I just felt, again, you know, probably my favourite saying in football is that uh, you get out what you put in, but it doesn't come in equal instalments. And, you know, I felt very much that if I keep pounding away doing this work, not only will I be more perceptive at seeing patterns and styles of play. But my presentation skills and my uh, ability to pass on the knowledge I wanted to pass on um, would improve as well. And, you know, that, that, that became a, you know, even now, I really enjoy looking at a game and analysing the trends, you know, and, and, the strengths and weaknesses of certain teams. And every team has a pattern of play. Even if you change players within, each team has a pattern of play. And within that pattern of play, you can identify the strengths and relative weaknesses. And that, for me now, is still the thing I enjoy most about watching a football game. You know, I, I probably prefer watching a, a game on... Uh, a video or whatever TV source, as long as I can fast forward, reverse, fast forward, reverse. And you go back and you just see people sometimes looking, you know, they're, they're facing that way, but they're looking that way and you know, and that, that little signal gives it all away, the whole thing they're trying to do. And, you know, those little body language hints are the things that still give me a buzz now when I watch football. Yeah, I remember some of the players really appreciating that because – I just go back now to some of those meetings and you said to one player, he'll do this and then he'll go that way. And on the Saturday, he was doing exactly that. And the player's like, how did he know when he moved that way, he was going to do that? There's a, there's a couple of sayings, Steve, that come to mind now. You, you, one thing you used to say to the boys was information is a light load to carry around. Knowledge. Knowledge, Knowledge is a light load to carry. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think that, you know, it, with players, you know, it, sometimes in meetings I'd say, listen, because of the analysis we'd done when I've, uh, my third year at Reading, you know, we, we had um, conclusions about different players' learning styles. And, you know, some players, 
um, you know, we, we came to the conclusion, you put them in that school room environment to put a video on and they fall asleep. So I would actually reference that sometimes. And we'd know those particular players and we would then take them out into the field and demonstrate in a more sort of tactile, uh, visual way, actually on the pitch, because their learning style wasn't suited to sitting in a, a classroom and looking at a video. And we found that to be very important. Um, but generally, most people, because we are, we're all products of the television age, you look at a video screen and you take in things. So, you know, we would do that. Um, and on a Friday morning, as you referred to there, 10 minutes, it's not a great deal out of anyone's life. Most people, the vast majority were really interested. And I could tell that from the response in the room. If you can hear murmurings and what have you, then you know you've lost them. But most people would look at it and, yeah, I know what's going to happen because he's told me and he's watched five games. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, the players did have that faith in me to know that I'd done my homework and now I was looking for that homework to have an impact on their performance. And they, I think they appreciated the work that we all did in preparation for those games. Another one of your sayings that has stayed with me all the time, Steve, seven words about attitude. Uh, you'll have to remind me that one. I've got a few about attitude. Attitude is contagious. Yeah, yeah infectious. Is oh, yours oh, worth attitudes catching? Attitudes are contagious, make yours infectious. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Well, again, this guy, Wally Downs, who was one of my coaches, always said, sign, sign attitude. Sign attitude, you can teach skill. And I think that is very much... When you, when you work in an environment where nowadays... You know, a premiership squad, 25 players, 25 different minds, nationalities, um, you know, ways of doing things, ways they've been brought up. You know, it, it's such potentially a chemical imbalance. Mm. And if you get a few, you know, there's no I in teams. If you get a few too many I's in there, mm. you haven't got a team. So... You very much, I was very conscious that we signed a good attitude. We made a few mistakes, but by and large, if you gave me one player with a bad attitude, with a great skill set, and a player with a lesser attitude, or a better attitude with a lesser skill set, I would take the attitude all day long. Now, other coaches, managers would do that differently. Well, I'll cope with those times when he doesn't be a career doesn't turn up properly or play properly. I can accept that because I know when he's on form, he's going to be brilliant. I wouldn't. You know, I think it's a, for the greater good of the group, attitude is the most important thing uh, for, for, for everybody involved. And that attitude also, you know, comes from the staff. The, the attitude that the staff has got to be, it's never us and them. It's just us. We're all in it together. And if he's not good enough, it's because I've not been good enough teaching him. So, you know, attitude is without doubt, probably, um, you know, the, the unifying bond, I think, with the best squads I've been involved with. Steve, for some of the younger people watching or listening to this, you started your career, I think, at Tranmere, but then yeah. went on to... Uh, Manchester United, but you had an unusual playing start because you were studying at the same time. Yeah. Well, looking back now, and, um, you know, people ask me about it and they just think, oh, the, the old times, you know, it could, couldn't happen now. And it couldn't happen now. I know it couldn't happen now. But um, I played for a boys' club team in Liverpool and just before my A levels, uh, a Tranmere scout came up to me after a game and said, oh, you know, Tranmere scout, we'd like you to come along for a trial. We're having a trial at the weekend. Would you come along? And I, I said to him, well, you know, thanks for the offer, but 
Uh, no thanks, I'm revising this weekend for my A-levels. And then probably about a month later, I'm still revise, revising. And at the time I was getting, you know, you get into that rut, very, very similar to the pandemic rut that so many of us are in. You know, the routine was getting monotonous and, and mind-numbing. And he literally phoned up, I think on a Saturday, the same scout, Eddie Edwards, I remember his name. And he said, uh, Steve, listen, we're, we're having another trial this weekend. Just wondering, you know, whether you'd come along. And I was going to say no again. And then he dropped in the magic words, uh, the trials of Prenton Park, Tranmere's home ground. I'm thinking, playing on a league ground? You know, I've been used to playing in the park. And he said, oh, it's uh, Prenton Park. And I go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I can just uh, manage a couple of hours to play at Prenton Park. So we had the trial game on a Sunday, and I was lucky that I, I was I used to play centre forward then, twin striker with I had a really big um, centre forward who I used to sort of pick up the bits off. He used to smash him around, and I'd pick up the bits. And in that game, I was paired with him in the trial match, and uh, I scored three three goals in the trial. And they said to me. Uh, Oh, you know, you've done really well. And they signed me that day on amateur terms. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just thought, oh, this is brilliant. I might get a chance to play at Prenton Park again. And um, I did my A-levels um, and I, I got uh, accepted by Liverpool University. But the term didn't start till October. They were training from July onwards, Tranmere. So they invited me in and they said to me, oh, you, you come along and do uh, pre-season training with us. And I said, yeah, I've got nothing else to do in there as well. So for me, who lived in Liverpool, to get to Birkenhead where Tranmere was, was a difficult journey. It was probably, uh, well, three buses plus the ferry uh, over the Mersey. But luckily for me, as a Liverpool fan, the goalkeeper for Tranmere Rovers at the time was Tommy Lawrence. And he used to drive past my house through Liverpool to get to Birkenhead himself. So after a couple of days of going by bus, it, we found out that he drove past where I lived. So he started to be picking me up. And I was a Liverpool fan as a kid. You know, the, the 1965 Liverpool team that won the FA Cup against Leeds, you know, Tommy was in goal. My heroes, the manager of Tranmere at the time, Ron Yeats, one of my heroes, Roger Hunt, my particular hero, Peter Thompson, Ian Callaghan, all these stars. And all of a sudden, every morning, I'm getting a lift to and from training with Tommy Lawrence. I couldn't believe it. You know, it was the best thing ever. He wasn't very talkative, mind you. And after training... If you weren't quick, he would just go without you. He literally, after training, he didn't do a great deal of training. <laughs> His nickname was the Flying Pig, so you can tell he was a little bit uh, porky, <laughs> I suppose, but he was a terrific bloke. But after training, he would walk around the showers and get changed and be in the car. He'd still be sweating by the time he got in the car. So if you weren't on your toes and ready for him, he'd just go and leave you there. So, you know, the great stories with him, Ron Yates, the manager. Uh, I spent a year as an amateur playing for Tranmere. I wanted to play in the Football League as an amateur. Don't ask me why. Corinthian spirit, I haven't got a clue why. Second year, I signed um, a part-time contract. And halfway through my second year, I got signed by Tommy Doherty. Um, Tommy Doherty, when I met him, said... I've never seen you play, but people whose opinions I respect say you're a good player, so that's good enough for me. And on the day I signed for Manchester United, I said to him, listen, I'm doing my second year at university. If I complete this year, I can do my third year anytime. So I'd like to complete my second year and, you know, I'll, I'll down, become full-time. And he said, don't you dare. He said, you finish your education. He says, because football will chew you up and spit you out. He says, you get a degree, you've got that for life. And I'm forever grateful, you know, 
for me, the great man passed away a couple of weeks back, Tommy Dog, he, he, he was a huge influence on my life, second only to my father. Wow. And ever so grateful that he, you know, made the decisions he did. And he allowed you, strangely, you didn't have to, to train, did you? Well, for, for 18 months, I trained on a Tuesday with the team. And the rest of the time, I trained by myself at home, my home. In fact, you know, some weeks when we didn't have a midweek game, which wasn't many, but enough, um, on a Wednesday, that's when you get into departmental football at university. And I played for Comic Con, Commerce and Economics. I was mindful of the fact that I couldn't play out because it, I might get injured, but I wanted to be there with my mates who I studied with. So I played in goal for Comic Con. And uh, my first year um, at, at uh, United, we, we got promotion. And uh, Comic Con also got to the final of the Interdepartmental Cup. <laughs> Well, as goalkeeper, I'm ashamed to, ashamed to say that we were beaten 5 1 by geography. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a different, different times. It couldn't happen now. But at, the at that particular period, there were quite a few university graduates. Alan Gowling before me at Manchester United, Steve Highway, Brian Hall, Alan Sudderby. You know, quite a few graduates had gone into to football, but I don't think any other graduate was doing it at the same time. I was lucky that we were winning. You know, we won the second division. I joined the club and I think I played 11, 12 games in the old second division. We were unbeaten. The following year was the first division. We finished third in the first division and also got to the FA Cup final. So, you know, I was lucky that we were doing well. You still hold a record, Steve, for appearances, consecutive appearances. Yeah, United well, again, as an outfield player. I don't think this will ever be beaten now because right. of squads and rotation. And it's the ultimate irony, I suppose, in my career that I, I went four seasons, four whole seasons without missing a game. And yet I had to retire through injury when I was 28. You know, the ultimate irony and... Uh, you know, I think Peter Schmeichel got to 180 of games once. And it, I think it previously I thought it would only ever be a goalkeeper who could do that. But now I don't think it will ever be beaten. The, the one, because of rotation, the different cup competitions and what have you, I don't think it will be uh, beaten. You know, and when you also add on United, you said, my first year there, they did a five week world tour at the end of the season. So you, so I went to Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, Los Angeles, you know, Indonesia, all this, playing games because United needed to make money at the end of certain seasons. So we did a five-week world, world tour and all the pre-season games. You know, even then, United were a massive, massive name and a, a brand that people wanted to be identified with. So... You know, we, we play games all over the place. So you include those games plus the 207 proper games and a lot of football in a short space of time. Crazy. Another record I think you hold is that one of the quickest goals ever scored in a youth team match. Oh, no, no, that wouldn't be me. I never I never played a reserve game at United. I only played first team. Was it, uh, there was a 12-second 12, 12 goal you scored? No, that was a World Cup. World Cup. That was the World Cup finals in 1982. Our first game was France. We played France. Uh, and Michel, Michel Platini was their captain. Um, Bill Taylor was the England coach. The manager was Ron Greenwood. And in training, we'd done with Don Howe as well. Don Howe was one of the coaches. We'd done a long throw routine where... Believe it or not, I had a decent long throw in those days. And uh, in the ninety, in in the first minute, um, I can't remember how the ball got there, but it was deep in the the right wing area. And I took this long throw, the routine, and the routine worked perfectly. Long throw, flick on Brian Robson coming in, volley into the back of the net. 
the quickest goal in, in World Cup ever at that time. And for that, he got this beautiful gold watch at the end of the tournament for the quickest goal. And I said to him, you owe me a few links on that for my long throw. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the links, mind you. <laughs> but yeah, the happy days. You know, and that particular World Cup, which was part of my injury problems, because I'd been injured the November before, and I desperately wanted to play in the World Cup, so I didn't have surgery before that World Cup, and um, I played the. It was a different setup for the World Cup then. We played in a group of four. We got through that, um, beat France, Qatar, and somebody else. And then we got into a group of three, which was Spain and Germany. And we were unbeaten in all the games we played. In the second phase, we drew two games nil-nil. But Germany got through because they beat Spain 2-0. Um, I played in the Germany game. And um, after that, I had a, a bad reaction with my knee. My knee swollen, swollen up and it didn't look as if I could play in the Spain game. So the night before the match, I agreed to have, and this is the first time I ever had it, was a, an injection in my knee to try and settle it down so I could play against Spain. And uh, it was a steroid injection and um, I had a bad reaction to it. Um, you know, I was sick, I was vomiting, I had a temperature and everything. And from Greenwood came in and uh, literally probably one o'clock in the morning. He was a real thoughtful man, Ron. He was very, very caring. He came in. He said, listen, Steve, I can't ask you to play tomorrow. And at the time, I was feeling <laughs> really rough. And I said, oh, no, I couldn't play. Ironically, when I woke up the next day, I felt all right and I could have played. But by then, I'm thinking, well, you know, it's, it's too much. I've hardly slept all night. And I wouldn't give my best. So I, I never played. We drew that game. It was the only game our two best players played in and only for the last half an hour. Kevin Ke Keegan and Trevor Brook in our two best players were injured for that tournament. And they only came in for the remaining minutes of the Spain game. But we we came home from that World Cup unbeaten. But it was, it was um, you know, it was... Um, a magnificent experience. When I came back, I had knee surgery. And I, I then, it, it was never, ever right. And probably about four or five years ago, I had an issue with my knee and I had to have another surgery. And the surgeon who, who did that surgery came to the conclusion that when I did my first injury, um, my cruciate had snapped but it snapped with such force, it wrapped around the posterior cruciate. So every subsequent operation, people had pulled on the ligaments and thought, well, it's still attached, so I'll leave it there. But the final surgery, the techniques were that much better. He said, you know, all this time, you've had no cruciate ligament. I played in a World Cup with no cruciate ligament and inevitably paid the price and I, I retired. After I retired, I, there was such a wave of sympathy for me that I was invited to all kinds of functions. And it, you know, great for a couple of weeks, but when it was becoming more and more sustained, I thought, I've got to get out of here and just decide what I want to do in my life. So, <laughs> as one does, I went to live in Amsterdam for three months and um, I got away from everything there. and. The highlight of my week in Amsterdam was on Sundays. I used to go down to Dam Square and get the English papers and read about English football. So I thought, well, there's still something within me that I've got to get rid of. So I came back, let it be known that I wanted to be uh, involved in football. And a couple of months later, Ron Nodes um, offered me the job at Crystal Palace. He, he'd employed Dave Bassett. Dave Bassett had left after four days. And he then phoned me and offered me the job. And that was the start of the journey, which to a certain extent still continues. <laughs> that was crazy because you was only 28 at the time, Steve. Yeah, 28. And as I said to you before, blind leading the blind. My first year, you know, I had this idealised way. I thought, well, we'll play the way Man United do. And you've got to remember that the Manchester United style which I'd learned, I suppose, with width and wingers and what have you, 
was very much the Preston style that Tommy Doherty had learned, you know, with Tom Finney wingers and, and you know, it, it, the way we played was very much akin to that design. So when I became a manager, I thought, well, we'll just play the same way, you know, hmm. pass it around here, there and everywhere and, you know, have a real sting if, when we go forward. But of course, you know, most of the players I had at that time were free transfers. The club had been going through a really sticky time. It just escaped relegation the previous two years. And my first year, we just escaped relegation. We finished my first year seventh from bottom. And that was the final day of the season. And that's the highest we'd been all year, seventh from bottom. You know, so many times during that first year, I, I was thinking, well, get me out of here. I just can't do it. But you just stick at it. I was very, very fortunate that Ron, um, Ron Nodes paired me with uh, Ian Evans, who was my assistant manager. Uh, Ian was terrific. You know, still is terrific. I see him now. He, he's still involved scouting. He's a uh, fabulous football brain. And he, he was such a crutch to lean upon my first year in management. And again, after a year of reality and understanding what football at that level was about, you know, my views of how the game should be played changed to such an extent now that, you know, I don't think there is a right way to play. There is a right way to play for the squad of players you have. And again, that goes back to recruitment. You have to have, I always say, you have to have a vision of how you want your team to play. And then you look at the squad of players you have and does the squad fit the vision? Uh, at most clubs, if it doesn't, you can't change the players. So you have to ad adapt the vision. Mm. You really do have to change the way that squad of players so that they can perform within the confines of what you want them to do. And again, in terms of performance, the thing that's always um, uh, tickled my, uh, press my buttons, I suppose, tickled my fancy was, how do you score goals? How do you score goals? You know, when I first started managing, it was very much Charles Hughes was in charge at the FA and it was very much a goal is scored, three passes and less. And it was, it was very much a derivative of long ball theory um, started by wing commander Charles Reap many, many years ago, mm. which is, I always say now to young coaches, you should learn about long ball theory. With wing commander Charles Reap, Wolverhampton Wanderers and Stan Cullis, um, you know, a lovely human being who I, I met I, a couple of times I drove, again, my thirst to try and be a better manager myself. You know, if you're going on a journey, the best thing you can do is speak to somebody who's already been there. And I got in touch with Stan Cullis, who was a pioneer of European football. Uh, his Wolves teams were one of the first to play European football, floodlit games. And his style of play was very much long ball direct. And I think now as a, an education it, it should be part of a coach's education to study, um, you know, long ball theory and, and make your own mind up about it, direct football. And that's, again, the, the thought process is kick-started. How do you score goals? How do you get the ball in the back of the net? It's not just about individual brilliance, although that is a huge factor. It is about... Uh, team adaptation, how do you get the ball into certain areas, how quickly, how slowly, what you're designing to do. And then um, getting a style of play which gives you the most opportunities to score. Yeah. Steve, you've uh, been, I say, inspirational throughout your career. And one reflection of that is probably the number of players you had at Palace who have gone on to become managers themselves and quite successful as well. Yeah, I often I've looked back at you know various teams and 
you know, some some players have been a surprise. Um, um, you know, various teams have been at. You look at the squad of players and you think, well, he's going to be a coach. He's going to be a coach. He's got no chance of being a coach. And <laughs> um, and yet they they've come through and and you know done okay. Um, Alan Pardew, like from day one, like you got to remember with Alan Pardew, I signed him when he was probably 25, 26, signed him from Yeovil, non-league. But when he came to Crystal Palace then, um, he was already running a Sunday team. So there was something about him. He came in and because he was more mature then, he'd be, he'd be in a glazier, you know, he'd be got <laughs> windows in. Um and he came in and he, you know, he'd worked, he'd lived, he knew what it was about. You know, he much preferred playing football to putting in windows, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, he came in and straight away he demanded respect because of the, just the way he conducted himself. Uh, and he took a Sunday team. He was very much sort of open atom coach at that time and you could just tell he was going to be had the right mindset to be successful um, you know the, the, there have been a lot of players who've, who've come and gone and uh, had tries you know Alex Dyer now who's just lost his job at uh, uh, Kilmarnock you know again I, I, I wouldn't have thought he would have been a coach but as soon as he finished playing he he, he took to it very, very easily, um, you know, and I'm sure he'll bounce back again. But there is no um, photo fit, I don't think, for what makes a good manager. There's an awful lot of people, you know, myself, I would say I, I never really wanted to be a coach. If I'd have had a full career as a player, I wouldn't have become a coach. It was only because I felt sort of unfulfilled as if I had something, not to prove, but something still to do within football because I retired early. And that sort of drove me to it. Um, there is no um, skeleton of what makes a successful coach. The personalities of all the, the managers who are successful are so, so different. You know, you look at Matt Busby, quiet or hard as nails. You look at Jose Mourinho, you look at Alex Ferguson, you know, all different. You know, what? one of my sort of um, hero types as a, a manager was Bill Shankly. This was, you know, I was brought up at Liverpool, watching Liverpool, you know, the first great Liverpool teams, Bill Shankly as manager. I was very fortunate when I played at Tranmere, he actually came at the request of Ron Yates, our manager, to one of our away games. We went and played, chilling him away. I think it was like the January of the season. <laughs> we hadn't won away from home all season. Bill Shankly comes along. We get the train from Liverpool Saturday morning. We stride through Gillingham at past one, two o'clock. We get to the game. We won the match. I think we won 3-2. First away game we'd won all year. And it was all because of this Jimmy Cagney-like figure who dressed immaculately, had the shiniest shoes I've ever seen on anybody. When he spoke, everybody listened. You know, we were in a, a carriage going from Lime Street to London and then getting trained from Euston to Gillingham. When he said something in the carriage, everybody listened. He just had that magnetic voice and personality. Um, he did something after the game to this day, I find, you know, amusing and interesting. After the match, we were in the dressing room. We'd won 3-2. Everyone was having a ball. We used to have a radio in the dressing room then. No TVs, nothing. And the results came on. And it would be... Uh, um, First division, and he goes through all the results. And at the end, and all the Scottish ones as well, at the end of listening to all the results, he said, right, ask me any results, any division. And you'd say, all right, okay, then Aldershot v whoever. 3-1 uh, Aldershot. 
he could remember him. He had that kind of mind, you know, just a little stupid little party piece. But I think he must have studied those fixtures for hours and hours beforehand. So when the result came up, he knew them. You know, a stupid little thing, but the, the personality of all successful managers are totally, totally different. But the, the, the goal is common. And the goal is to reference what I used to do, or hopefully did, excuse me, at uh, Reading was WNG, win next game. That is the currency of every successful manager, win next game. Because if you lose four or five, you're in trouble. Steve, I could talk to you all day and be enthralled. And uh, every time I talk to you, I learn something new as well. Conscious of the time, I'm going to finish with some quick fire questions if I can. Yeah. Uh, just to get a little insight, really, Steve. Can you tell me what your favourite book is? Well, uh, I, w I would say that changes um, periodically. I, as a, a young player, I used to read an awful lot of Leon Yoris. Um, I, I, I think to say before, the, the book I've probably read most or more often is Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. And not because I want to be rich. I've never wanted, even with, within football, I always say, uh, I don't want to be famous, I want to be good. And that's that's been, and to try and make myself better, I think Think and Grow Rich is a book I reference more than any other. Lovely. Your favourite film? Uh, I'm a big fan of Robert Redford. I don't know why. Favourite film, I would probably say uh, Jeremiah Johnson which is about a man who goes into the outback and lives a sort of a lonely life. Um, I remember watching that in Liverpool when I was a student, actually, uh, Liverpool University. I had a couple of hours between lectures and went to the cinema and saw this film. And that's probably a film I really enjoy watching more than most. I've not seen that, so I'll have to catch that one. Yeah. Favourite quote, Steve? Again, from a football sense, I would probably say you get out what you put in, but it doesn't come in equal instalments because it, inevitably in football, sometimes you, the harder you try, the less uh, response, reaction, success you get. And you've got to have that ability to, to push on through because, you know, the process is a grind, but the process has to be consistent for 40 odd weeks a year. You can't you can't be successful and deter from it. You 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 have to be one hundred percent focused to that process. Steve, you have a hypothetical dinner party, six people, you included. You can invite five, past or present. Oh, when you have. Let me, well, Robert Redford, I would do, without doubt. Probably. I really, at various times, I've become a little bit of a, um, a Kennedy person. I really enjoy the Kennedy clan as such. Um, I once went to uh, Hyannisport before it was so sort of massively fashionable to be a, a, a Kennedy person. And I became a bit of a stalker of the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport and got right to the gates of, of the compound. And I'm thinking, surely somebody's going to stop me, given the Ken Kennedy history. So surely somebody's going to stop me soon. But I got right, right to the gates. And um, so Robert Kennedy would probably be the one who fascinates me the most, not JFK or, t you know, Teddy, I think, is in his own way is fascinating. But Robert Kennedy, I think, is very much a life unfulfilled. I, I feel he would have made a major impact on American society. So Robert Kennedy, Bill Shankly, without doubt, uh, three. Um, a Holocaust survivor. Um, no one in particular, but just somebody who's been through, you know, you talk about tough times and, and what have you. You know, I can't think of anybody who would have... Um, had tougher times and somebody who's come through that you know I've been to Auschwitz and Birkenau and you know nothing but the ultimate respect um, so 
any Holocaust survivor, you know, lest we forget, I think is still very much a, a thing we should pay more reverence to. Uh, one more. I'm lost. No, I can't think of another one at the moment, but of the, possibly my dad, my dad, I would say. Yeah, lovely. That'd be a some dinner party. Steve, well, I, I don't think... <laughs> no, oh, Gary Player. Gary Player would be another one. When I retired, I always remember when I retired, um, I retired, I think it was on a Wednesday or a Thursday, it was officially renounced. And I am a golf fan, I enjoy my golf. And Gary Player was sort of a, a little bit of a hero of mine because he was the little man taking on everything. You know, again, his problems in South Africa and the apartheid issues and um my pal who was in charge of football focus at the time arranged for me to meet Gary Blair on that Saturday. It was the Piccadilly match play at Wentworth at the time. And I met uh, Gary Blair. So I would definitely invite him. Another fascinating character. He would be, uh, you know, the little fella who's taken on everything and, you know, come through all the issues in South Africa. And, you know, we, we at Crystal Palace, um, you know, we were, the I'm very proud to say we were the first club side to tour South Africa after apartheid. You know, and I look back now, obviously, you know, Black Lives Matter is a big thing at the moment in society and, you know, the, the uh, social media abuse and what have you. But, you know, my black players in those early days when we were going to games and the verbal abuse they took at games and they just took it and came back and um, played and played and played and then we went to South Africa we did a, a football clinic in Soweto um, you know sig real significant things in the, the window of time um, but you know nothing but respect for my black players in those days and as I say the, they're heroes they are heroes of the black players of today because they didn't have the vehicle to protest. They just had to take it. And they came back, took it, and were proud black men and proud footballers. And you, you inspired them a lot as well, Steve. Steve, you, you left every club you've left, I think, welcome you back with open arms every time. If there was something you'd like people to say when you you leave a club, when you've left a place where you've managed, what sort of thing would you like them to be saying after you've left? Oh, Palamio O'Reilly, that's, uh, that's a big one. I, I always talk about respect in, in football, so, you know, I, I would like, um, you know, people to respect my approach, I think, more than anything. No, football management is hard. You have to make real difficult decisions sometimes, you know, just in choosing an 11. Sometimes the hardest thing ever is telling somebody, and I always try and do this, tell somebody why I'm not choosing them. Um, with young players, the hardest thing I ever found to do as a, a manager was telling a young apprentice, you know, at 17, 18 years of age, that we're not going to offer him a contract you know, difficult, difficult things to do. And to a certain extent, there isn't an honourable way of doing it. Uh, it just has to cold, hard reality sometimes. Um, you know, one of the players I had to tell this to, this has just come to me um, on the top of my head. Um, one of the players I had to tell that he wasn't good enough was a young 18-year-old Darren Can. Now, if you know Darren Cam, when I was, he was a young apprentice at Crystal Palace. He was a decent player, but we felt just not good enough to progress with us. He, he was from the Norwich area, I think, as a boy. And we'd acquired him somehow. I can't remember how. But I had to tell him that we weren't offering him a contract. And Darren Cam then became a linesman. And then he was the linesman in the World Cup final. So to a certain extent, you know, he, I think he would have been a journeyman footballer at best. Uh, he took up being a linesman and then became the very best linesman in the world. 
So, you know, being football is full of rejections. So many people have been rejected by one club and come back and be successful somewhere else. So that was the thing that got me through those decisions about telling young kids that they, they weren't going to be offered contracts because I, I knew it would either make, well, hopefully it would make them. I, I didn't think it would break anyone, but it would be a hard time for some. So, you know, football is full of hard decisions and the way you implement those decisions tells people an awful lot about you. So I would hope that people would say, you know, to mention the words that you like to be associated with, honesty, integrity, respect. They would be the words, I think. Steve, you got those in abundance. And uh, yeah. I know... I know you're mentoring young managers now, but I'd love to see you back managing uh, in the near future in perhaps one of those 20 or so clubs that would be uh, have a good good chairman and uh, a decent yeah. of players that you could take over. But, Steve, it's been wonderful talking to you again, as always. Thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, Rob. You know, it's uh, it's not often you get to talk about yourself for an hour and a half. I've quite enjoyed it. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I'll be looking at your podcast in weeks to come to see see who else is in the uh, the hot seats. So, I look forward to those. Steve, thanks again. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. Cheers.